to Expert Flyer Hot Topics. I'm your host, Lisa Caslin, and we've got a special guest with us today. Ford Cochran is the Director of Programming for National Geographic Expeditions. And for those who have not gotten the memo yet, this year is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the National Park Service. And you may ask, well, why is National Geographic our guest today? Well, they have a very long history together, and Ford is going to talk a little bit about that and maybe touch on the some 410 areas that the National Park Service uh, covers and, and manages and talk about some of the initiatives that National Geographic has underway this year for the celebration. So welcome to the show, Ford. Thank you so much, Lisa. Glad to be here. Good. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of the interview, talk a little bit about uh, what you do for National Geographic. Sure. I've worked for National Geographic for almost 25 years and done all sorts of things here. I have written for National Geographic magazine and for our books. I have helped to launch our very first website, nationalgeographic.com, way back in 1996 and worked for the site for many years. I've also traveled on the trips that we offer for uh, travelers who wish to take educational trips for us for 20 years this summer. It'll be my 20 year anniversary of doing that. Over the last five years, I've been director of programming for National Geographic Expeditions, our educational travel arm, where I am responsible for selecting the writers, photographers, scholars, explorers, and staff we send on our trips for travelers all around the world. Awesome, and I know you have a lot of personal experience uh, trudging through the national parks yourself, right? Oh, I do. They are <laughs> my favorite places in the world. I'm privileged to be able to, you know, to have been able to travel so many places for my job, but there's no place on earth I love more than America's national parks. Cool. So I didn't know this when I was doing a little bit of research before talking to you that uh, National Geographic was one of the original patrons uh, that really convinced the U.S. government to initiate the National Park Service. Talk a little bit about the history. It's true. We, we really have done all we can to support the idea of the parks and the creation of the National Park Service. In the very early days when we had in our country a hundred years ago, a handful of national parks but no federal agency to manage them. Mm -hmm. Stephen Mather, who was a, a well-off businessman, um, became convinced that it was important that America create a National Park Service and he mm -hmm. gathered a group of people he thought could be influential. Fortunately uh, for us, for us at National Geographic, one of them was uh, Gilbert Grosvenor, who was the fellow who for about 50 years was editor of our magazine for many of those years. He was president of the Geographic, immensely influential in setting the course for this organization. They all gathered in the Sierra Nevada, in the you know amid the big trees out west in California, and. Mather spent time explaining why this was important, let everyone basically drink the Kool-Aid, and we were completely <laughs> on board after that. Uh, uh, Grosvenor came back and he committed the resources of National Geographic to helping to build the case for ownership of the national park system, really investing in it and managing it right. And uh, so we dedicated the April 1916 issue of National Geographic magazine entirely to a set of stories that was titled Land of the Best, a celebration mm -hmm. of the national parks, and distributed to distributed that issue to everyone in Congress as well as to the American people, and oh, wow. uh, helped helped build the case. And uh, ever since then, back then, you know, we invested uh, our dollars, our editorial coverage, our passion in supporting the creation the expansion and the protection of national parks, first in the U.S., now all around the world, and most recently doing the same for our oceans with national marine sanctuaries all around the world. That's, that's fantastic. It's good. Good stuff. So talk a little bit. We're, we're here full circle now, 100 years later, fast forward, and you are kicking off this year-long uh, exploration of the power of parks. Talk about that campaign. What's going on there? Absolutely. Well, it's the biggest editorial initiative in National Geographic's 125 plus year history. Mm -hmm. uh, we have devoted our resources to canvassing the parks. We have sent photographers to spend, many of them spend more than a year camped out in national parks, wow. dedicating an, an, a story or more in every issue of National Geographic magazine this year to celebrating parks here in the United States mm -hmm. and around the world. Uh, we have multiple TV specials on the National Geographic Channel and on Nat Geo Wild, uh, our mm -hmm. cable, cable networks, which were broadcast here in the States and elsewhere around the mm -hmm. world. Uh, we have new and newly, uh, newly released uh, editions of guidebooks for the national mm -hmm. parks, a new history of the National uh, Park Service uh, that was mm -hmm. created by, uh, written by my good, good friend, Kim Hecox, 
and mm -hmm. all sorts of resources for families and kids, anyone who wants to plan a trip to the national parks, even a course about the national parks, uh, for which I'm wow. the lecturer, on the geology of the national parks with the great courses. Very cool. Okay. So I'm a big, big fan of your guidebooks. Uh, and I, I know that uh, you just published the eighth edition of your wildly popular uh, Guide to the Parks. So, you know, considering this, this big anniversary, what did you do differently? Was there, you know, um, sort of a, an inventory done of the parks? Did you, you know, do something really extraordinary and special? What are some of the jewels that have popped out in this new edition? Well, we took, the, the book has been a popular bestseller for us for years and years and years, prior editions of it. But for this Park Service Centennial, we, we, we took the book and we remade it from the ground up. So mm -hmm. we, got, we got authors to create new, new text about every national park. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to feature um, the latest, you know, the, the most up-to-date information, uh, really invest in telling the story of the Park Service and giving mm -hmm. an introduction to its, uh, to its history mm -hmm. uh, so that people would have that right on hand. More than 300 new photographs. Wow. Um, all, just all sorts of new material and great material from authors who are, uh, are really invested in each of the parks as well so that you could hear the story in the voices of people who are most closely associated with the parks who know them best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. And, and, I, and, may, I, and may, I, may I hold the book up so people can please see Please do it. I'm really, <laughs> I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud. Of, I, had, I had nothing to do with creating this book, but I absolutely adore it. It's uh, the yeah. prior editions and now this new one. I keep them with me everywhere that I go. Yeah, no, it's it's beautiful, and as always, the photography is just breathtaking. And what I love about uh, this year's is the the companion guide that you've created for kids. It's almost like the the fun reader's digest version. Very consumable, very snackable for kids. Um, you know, f focusing on the bugs and the animals and the little yeah. factoids. And yeah, I I really thought that, that you guys did a good job. So uh, folks should should take a look and pick that up. I, I guess Amazon.com, uh, sells at Barnes and Noble, etc. Right? They do. Okay. So talk about your personal preferences. I'm dying to know. So you know, if you were somebody who was you know, thinking about kicking off a U.S.-based vacation this year and wanted to take in a national park. Do you have two or three favorites that, wow, you can't go wrong? Well, no matter what your age, no matter what your physical ability, yep. what should you consider? Well, uh, there, there's that cliche about which of your children do you love best? Um, <laughs> I, I, I really do love every national park. I mean, for me, a, a day spent in a national park is kind of a day one. Uh, uh -huh. So they all have so much to offer. And, um, you know, the big parks, a, a lot of people have never visited the big parks. Uh -huh. uh, you know, many, many people have never been to Yosemite National Park, have never been to Yellowstone National yeah. Park, the Grand yeah. Canyon. And if you haven't, you owe it to yourself to get to those parks, to see those in your lifetime. If you've been before, you probably want to get back and see them again. But even the parks that you know may not be so well known, I mean, Glacier National Park, um, oh my goodness, Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park, maybe everyone knows the photographs of the big granite cliffs in Yosemite Valley of half uh -huh. Capitan, but maybe people aren't as familiar with Zion in Utah. Well, Zion uh -huh. is like Yosemite, only it's red sandstone towering thousands Ooh. and thousands of feet up above the valley floor fantastic hikes, easy, accessible hikes that everyone can do, and real challenges if, uh, if you want to charge up a couple thousand feet and get a great view. So, um, uh, so, I mean, kind of the good news is that all the parks have options for every kind of, every kind of traveler, things that'll invite kids, that'll welcome kids, uh, things that'll work for, uh, for travelers who have difficulty um, you know, uh, taking on a really aggressive hike or a climb or kayaking, things like that. Um, yeah. Really something for everyone. That, yeah, that was my question. Are, are, so are all the parks accommodating to all visitors? The, all the parks have, you know, make some kind of accessibility available to, you know, everyone, everyone who comes. I'll say there are parks in Alaska. As the, as the whole National Park Service concept evolved, right. um, uh, the notion, uh, originally the parks were built, and, and Mather himself, and mm -hmm. Horace Albright, who, who was his, his wingman, if you will, mm -hmm. and, uh, and ultimately became the second director of the National Park Service. They were really concerned about Americans visiting the parks and making them accessible. Cars, 
were, became big and they and they wanted they built roads they built visitor centers they built fabulous lodges and hotels other kinds of accommodations in the parks to make it easy for people to visit later you know over the decades uh, mm -hmm. you know over the generations the concept of wilderness came forward and and, mm -hmm. and champions arose for wildlife and for wilderness for keeping parks pristine so mm -hmm. for instance many of the huge national parks in Alaska where our largest national parks are located yeah. uh, have two roads or one road or no roads at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so obviously those are more of a challenge to get to, very rewarding for those who can, who can afford to, um, mm -hmm. but also who are you know are able to backpack or able to uh, get on the river and, and make their way into those parks or get in a small plane and do it. But obviously mm -hmm. they're gonna be more challenging. Now, mm -hmm. most of the parks in the lower 48 are very accessible to, uh, mm -hmm. to lots of people. There's a, a place where you can see the contrast though, is mm -hmm. Sequoia, Kings Canyon. Technically, mm -hmm. there are two national parks in California, in the Sierra Nevada, a few hours south of Yosemite. Uh -huh. um, but those parks, um, Sequoia was built at the time when accessibility was paramount, and you can drive your car through giant trees. They actually made oh, wow. the a novelty, you know, so, and get great photographs and have all kinds of fun. When Kings Canyon became a national park, um, that that park was kept largely pristine. It's lar it's it's very similar to Yosemite in terms of the landscape. Of big granitic landscape with uh -huh. wonderful, wonderful pine forests and alpine meadows and all those sorts of features. But for the most part, you have to hike to get into yeah. the experience. You can make one drive out and see a phenomenal view. But if mm. you want to spend time in that park, you're going to have to hike to do it. So okay. the parks collectively offer a big range of uh, accessibility options. Fair enough. And the book does, uh, does feature that information. So that's good. All right. So before we let you go, any tips in particular um, for making the experience the best that it can be? Sure. The um, well, I would say one, you know, just getting out there is important. Mm -hmm. If you find time to go, go. And it may not be one of these big parks. You know, out west there are all these big, wonderful parks. If you live out west, maybe it's yes. very easy to get to them. If you live back east, as I do, it's a bit more of a planning mm -hmm. process. If you want to stay in the wonderful park lodges, I love to stay inside the national parks when I go visit, if I can, mm -hmm. either to, to stay in one of the hotels, you know, in the lodges in the parks or to camp. Um, mm -hmm. That usually takes a little bit of planning ahead. So mm -hmm. the earlier you can plan, the better. But still, mm -hmm. last minute openings, openings do become available. And so, you know, don't write off a trip to the parks just because you didn't plan a year out. Right. Um, but also, don't write off the parks that are so close to your home. Of course, here back east, yeah. Great Smoky Mountains National Park okay. is actually yeah. the most visited national park because so many of us live close to it. It's absolutely wonderful. You feel like you're in another world, removed wow. from big cities and civilization when you're in the middle of that park. Uh -huh. Here uh -huh. near D.C., we're very, very lucky to have Shenandoah National Park, uh -huh. as well as all the monuments, such as the National Mall itself, which is administered by the Park Service. Mm -hmm. A Rock Creek Park, right here in the city, a little piece of, of wilderness, of wildness, uh, right here in, in busy Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So the parks in your own backyard are also fantastic places to visit. Many people never think of those, never take the time to go and visit them. So I would say it's great to do it. Okay. Then read up in advance as much as you can. Of course, I'd say grab our guidebooks. And yeah. if you really do decide you, you want to get out to the parks and aren't sure how to do it, um, one other way that you can do it is with the geographic, of course. We welcome people who want to come to the parks. We send our best photographers, scholars, and explorers out to the parks every year in winter and summer. We're in Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park, Glacier, Olympic National Park. We are in Yosemite and the Grand Canyon, Bryce and Zion, Glacier Bay with a small yeah. ship in Alaska. So we would be delighted to take you to. Awesome. Okay. So give us your website for people that want more information. Where can they go hunt you down? Well, come to nationalgeographic.com and look for whatever it is you want. Of course, we're such a big organization. You'll find a lot there. It's an umbrella, but you can access it. Um, okay. Our books are available in the National Geographic store on our site, as well as Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and booksellers everywhere. And you can also find our trips at nationalgeographicexpeditions.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Ford. It was wonderful having you. And please come back again. Absolutely, I will. Anytime you like, Lisa. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. You too.